Welcome, everyone. I am Bob Warzelbacher, the director of the Respect Life Office for the Archdiocese of Cincinnati, and this is our video podcast series that we call Being Pro-Life. Each month, we discuss a different topic in the Respect Life arena. We'll hear a personal story from someone deeply affected by that issue, and finally, we'll share ways that you can get involved. This week, we're going to talk with Jason Everett, Catholic author and international speaker on the virtue of chastity. He also founded the Chastity Project, an organization that promotes chastity to high school and college students. So welcome to the show, Jason. Thank you for having me on. Jason, so first off, I just gave that brief intro for you. You've written several books. You've traveled around the world talking about chastity. But what else fills the day of Jason effort for our listeners? Well, we've got eight kids, so that, that's pretty filling. So we've got eight kids ranging from uh, 16 years old down to one year old. So, Oh, my goodness. That's great. <laughs> so this podcast is about being pro-life. You've been quoted as saying the pro-life movement needs to realize the importance of saving babies five years before they're conceived. So what do you mean by that? Yeah, well, I got involved in this ministry by doing three years of sidewalk counseling and when you're every week meeting women for the first time who are having an abortion in 45 minutes, you just start feeling late. You just start feeling like, well, why couldn't I have met this girl when she was 16 years old instead of when she's 24 going in to get an abortion? It, it, you kind of felt like I was throwing sandbags on the banks of a flooded river when there's a dam a quarter mile upstream that's busted. And I figured, why don't we just go upstream? Like instead of addressing the supply of abortion, why don't we address the demand for it, which is unchastity? And because if that could get taken care of, this stream would dry up. And so I realized that sidewalk counseling, legislative work, I mean, that's got its place, super important. But I just felt that, you know, my calling was more of the preventative aspect of like, let's go to where this root of the issue is and really address that. Because I don't think you can be truly pro-life without understanding the importance of being authentically pro-love. So. so that makes perfect sense. That's why you talk to high school and college kids. Now, are you able to, so where do you go? Do you talk mostly at Catholic universities and schools? Are you able to get into the public schools? How does that work out for you? We do speak in Catholic schools, public schools, evangelical schools. Obviously, in the public schools, you need a principal who's willing to take a little bit of risk. We don't bring any religious content into those presentations, but it's a different climate. I remember one public school in New York canceled the assembly right before it, and principal calls me and explains they need to back out. I said, well, I'm sorry, did something come up? And she said, well, yeah, the administration here is getting kind of cold feet because they heard you're coming. And I said, well, remember, this is an, a secular talk. There's no religious content from beginning to end. And she said, I understand. But she said, they're kind of worried that you're going to say a particular word during the talk. And I said, OK, well, what's the word? I can probably just work around it. And she said, they're afraid you're going to say the word marriage during your talk. Oh, and I'm my. like, what? I'm like, what do you want me to tell the kids to save sex for? Like, save it for later? I'm like, that's after sixth period, lady. Like, where's the finish line here? Um, but they actually canceled the entire assembly because there were administrators at that school forming a thousand kids who didn't even want them to hear the word marriage. And so, yeah, we're fighting a different battle in the public schools, but hey, not like the Catholic ones are squeaky clean either. I mean, sometimes the Catholic school administration and teachers need the chastity talk more than the kids do. I mean, this is an issue of virtue that all of us need to embrace. So thanks be to God, we are able to get into the secular institutions. We've spoken at Harvard, Princeton, United States Air Force, and Naval Academies. And so there's a lot of people that realize the importance of this virtue, regardless of your religious affiliation. Right. So, so, so Jason, marriage, I, I don't want to beat this too much, but what more specifically even is the problem with saying the word marriage? Well, I think their issue was that if I said safe sex for marriage and my presentation is heteronormative, meaning all my references to marriage are between your future husband, your future wife, then that's discriminatory speech because you're kind of implying that marriage is for a man and a woman. And that can really upset some of our parents who are same-sex couples sending the kid to the school using state dollars to bring in an abstinent speaker who's heteronormative. And so, you know, during the public school talks, I don't really address the topic of homosexuality specifically, but anything even related to them is like the third rail. Like you can't touch it. I mean, you're just going to get electrocuted. So, Unfortunately, there's just such a resistance there in some of the public schools. 
thought that might be what that was related to, but, yeah. uh, but I wasn't sure. Now, so obviously when you speak with at public schools, you're talking about chastity, I suppose, from a secular, from a practical aspect, I suppose, what maybe break down what the, what the argument is, if you will, for chastity before marriage in your talks at public schools. Yeah, thank you for the question. I mean, one of the beauties of St. John Paul II's teachings on theology, the body, love and responsibility, is that it argues not so much from the outside in, like here's the laws of the magisterium, now here's why you should obey them. It's more from the inside out, like what is it you really long for? What is it you really want? And so I try to explain to these young people that chastity is a virtue that frees you to love, and it frees you to know if you're being loved. Because these kids like us, I mean, they're made for love. And if a kid thinks, if a girl thinks like sex equals love, She's willing to risk getting pregnant, willing to risk getting an STD, willing to risk anything if it means she could just have a shot at love. But if we can show them, no, it's this virtue of chastity that frees you to know if a guy even loves you to begin with. Because a lot of these girls feel wanted by a guy, but he doesn't want the girl any more than a smoker wants a cigarette, right? I mean, smokers don't want cigarettes. Smokers want the feeling they get from the nicotine in the cigarette. And once they burn that thing down, they just flick it to the curb. And that's how a lot of girls feel after being disposed of for after these broken sexual relationships. Like he never wanted me to begin with. And so this virtue of chastity liberates a young woman to know if she's being wanted for who she is or simply for the pleasure that she can offer a man. And, and so we don't go in there wagging our fingers to the kids and shaming them and guilt tripping them and scaring them. It's like, no, what does authentic human love look like? And, and how do you find it? And a lot of these kids, and one boy came up to me at public school and he said, Jason, I know what you mean about divorce, Jason. My dad is on his ninth marriage. And wow. it's like, whoa. I mean, these kids are hungry to be challenged in a way that's going to lead to authentic joy. And so I find that universally, they're remarkably receptive and open to this message of chastity. Because most high school kids are virgins. And about 70% who have had sex privately admit that they wish they waited longer and it was kind of a disappointment. So what you've got is a massive quiet majority that are open to this message. And you just got to tap into that desire for real love. And I find that they go for it. Right. It's, it's so true that people hear that chastity message, they think it's just some rule, some or even some outdated rule, right? And it's just, but the beauty and the freedom that comes from that, from understanding that when you restrict yourself to sexual encounters with uh, with someone you're committed to and you're married to, there's freedom in that, not restriction in it. There's freedom to love in that. There's freedom to know who's being loved in it. There's freedom to be able to raise children in the environment that is more ideal for a baby in the first place. Maybe we can switch gears for a second here. We know the pregnancy care centers, right? Do a great job of accepting a woman in a crisis pregnancy, where she is, loving her, helping her see how she can make the choice for life, whether that's parenting that child or placing that child for adoption. But what ought they be doing along the lines of helping them not be in that same situation again the next year and the next year? And have you seen pregnancy centers that do that well and those that don't do that well? Chastity, I think more and more crisis pregnancy centers are realizing is essential in forming these women because it's not simply about talking them out of an abortion. Most of the time it's about talking them out of a lifestyle that led to that crisis pregnancy to begin with. And so if we're not really addressing this issue, even if that girl walks out the door and keeps the baby, you're probably going to see her, you know, 18 months from now with another pregnancy, perhaps from a different guy. And so I'm finding more and more crisis pregnancy centers are integrating into their approach of helping these young women, helping them understand what love is supposed to look like. Because many of them come from homes, maybe they didn't receive the love of the fathers that they deserved, and so they're looking for that love in the arms of other men. And so many crisis pregnancy centers will actually give out the resources we create. Everything on our website at chastity.com is $3 or less. So that way, crisis pregnancy centers get boxes of these books for chastity on women, for women how to start over, how to heal, how to break free from these relationships, and I find the young people are just, the, the women just are remarkably receptive to find out what love is supposed to look like. One of our books, How to Find Your Soulmate Without Losing Your Soul, the first chapter is the top 10 guys to avoid. And so I know a lot of Christ Praise Centers give those to every single woman that comes in the door. Because if we can get them on track with what authentic human love is supposed to look like, then they're not going to come back in a year and a half with another crisis in their life. They're going to realize what love looks like, and they're going to hold out for the love that they deserve. So Jason, do you have a website or something you want to mention? Like if you're running a pregnancy care center and you're like, oh, I, I would love to do better outreach for that, you know, and help the women that come to a center to not have to come back to this center. Where should they go? What should they do? Who should they call? 
Yeah, thank you for the question. If they just go to our website, chastity.com, and you click in the store on the word bulk, you'll see all of the resources that we offer for $3 or less. Also, I mean, if you can't afford that $3 or less, that's okay. Just click get involved and hit the button that says projects and say, and email us there and say, hey, I'd like to give away, you know, maybe a hundred books to the women in our center. Just let us know. We'll just send it to you for free. We will give it to you. We'll gift it to you as long as you get it in the hands of those women. I know one woman who does Crisis Pregnancy Center also helps out women who struggle, you know, making a living off the street with prostitution. She says, we take your books and we put them in a motel next to the coffee machine in the lobby where the prostitutes go and get their coffee in the morning. And all the women take those free books and those resources to help them heal and hopefully start over. And so that's, that's one reason we're doing it. We know there's so many awesome apostles out there that just need resources to put in the hands of those who need them most. So you just go to chastity.com and you can click the button there and get those resources. We even have a podcast that they can connect to uh, on the website to share audio content and YouTube clips, all kinds of digital resources to spread this message of chastity. Thanks, Jason. You know, you reminded me, I, I heard you speak a few times, and I, I think there was one time you were telling a story of where you felt the call from God, this push to speak to someone who you knew was a prostitute in a parking lot or somewhere or something like that. And uh, did you want to share that story? I thought that was a great story to share maybe with the listeners. Yeah, no, I remember when, when I lived in San Diego, there's a hardware store like 10 minutes from our house. It always, I always have to go through home projects. And, you know, maybe a mile down the road from it was a strip club. And you know, every time I drive to the hardware store, you pass by the strip club, say Hail Mary, and just keep going. And but oftentimes outside the strip club, there's like a little picnic bench where the, the women would be, you know, smoking a cigarette before their performances. And you know, I would just say a prayer for them, keep going. But I just each time I'd pass by, I have this nagging sense that like you need to go talk to them. I mean, praying is great, but like you gotta add to the prayer and you gotta speak to them because who else is going to? And then one day I just felt the Holy Spirit just like today, you need to go. And I started like kind of bargaining myself out of it with God. I'm like, hey, look, I'm not going to go out there unless there's only one woman outside because I don't want some big show or a confrontation. I don't want to be all weird and awkward. And, uh, and I'm not going to pull over unless I have something to give her. I don't know what to say. And I look over the passenger seat of my car is one copy of my wife's book, Pure Womanhood, on how she started over. I start driving by, look out. Sure enough, there's one woman sitting in the parking lot, sitting at that picnic table, and I'm like, okay, no more excuses. So I hit the blanker, I pull in, and I'm like, what if I get an accident? Like, you know, chastity speaker gets rear-ended in strip club parking lot. Like, this isn't going to look good for PR. But I like, just got to go. So I just pulled up that, you know, alongside, and I rolled down the window, and she came to the car. And I, I just said, hey, this is just a little book my wife wrote and her story and kind of how she started over. And, and you know, the woman just was so gracious of receiving it and just so open to it. And I just looked her in the eyes. And it was like, it just felt like no one had even looked her in the eyes in like five years because it's so busy looking everywhere else, but her eyes were like dark. I mean, it was like charcoal uh, of just the weight of that lifestyle, but just to be looked at by another person, to see into them and just to give her some love for a moment, give her the book and wish her the best. And I don't know where she today. I mean, hopefully she read it and she quit. I don't know, but you never know what can happen. In fact, we got an email from a woman once. She apparently heard our chastity talk. I don't know how she got a hold of it, but she was a stripper. And after she heard the talk, she said, I'm done with this. And I'm going to go get some of my other coworkers. So she brought our chastity DVD. She bought it and she brought it with an entire television set into the dressing room of the strip club where she showed the other strippers a chastity talk in the back room of the strip club. Like, I mean, that's a place I'm never going to get to give that message, but you give it to the right person and they can bring it and do amazing things with it. And so and we're never outside the reach of God's mercy. So Jason, that reminds me of a good question I'd like to ask people. What can the typical person out there, if you will, the typical person in the pew, right, who's listening in to help spread this message, right, of, of chastity, and in that way, help the pro-life movement? Yeah, well, thank you for the question. I mean, what can you do? A lot of stuff. First, prayer and fasting. I mean, it's the most important thing. Second is to live it out yourself in your own marriage and your own relationships, to be a witness of embracing that virtue, no matter where you're at in life. But then third, like get involved. You know, maybe you're not the public speaker type. That's fine. Maybe you can bring a public speaker into the schools in your area or to the youth group or the confirmation retreat. You know, at chastity.com, we've got different speakers, book one, and like, well, the school's not bringing speakers in. Hey, let's do Zoom. 
you know, let's do a Zoom assembly. We do virtual talks where we'll get into the religion classes, give them formation that way, or you can get our DVDs, give it to the religion teacher to show to the kids. Or you can go to the website, chassis.com, get the resources in bulk and think, okay, who do I want to reach out to? Well, let's get the kids in the confirmation class. So let's get the, that down the street, there's that all boys high school. Let's give them all a copy of that book for the guys on how to break free from lust and porn. Touch base with the campus ministers. Say, hey, would you be open to receiving this gift of these resources for the young guys? And more often than not, they'll be like, absolutely, send that stuff on. We could use it. And so our job is to kind of be like arms dealers of like giving people the resources and the weaponry that they can then use. So you don't have to be the speaker or the author to get involved. We've created the resources. So if you want to share them, we've made it as cheap as possible for you to do that. And I think it's very clear to see how the virtue of chastity ties into the demand for abortion. Right, but you also talk a lot about pornography, and I can see people not making that connection quite as quickly. Right, so where is the connection there between that pornography and the chastity and the demand for abortion? Yeah, a lot of people don't see the connection, but it's there. In fact, I remember reading of one woman who was in the porn industry herself, and she said she had to quit after her fourth abortion because it was like just a trauma and the toll that that took on her poor heart. But not only on the people within the industry, those viewing it learn to separate life from love. They learn to divorce the body from the soul, or you're just consuming the body of another person for your gratification, and you're separating life from love. So that the sexual gift, was, which was meant for procreation and union, get split. There's no authentic union. There's no exchange of gift of life. It's just the exchange of pleasure. And then when we enact this in our own lives and think, oh, well, well sex is for recreation, adult, harmless entertainment. And then the reality of the meaning of human sexuality comes into existence with a positive pregnancy test. People think that, oh, well, something happened wrong. Like it was a mistake. We got pregnant. It's like, no, <laughs> like they say, like, if you get pregnant from sex, it doesn't mean something went wrong. It means something went right. But once we have engaged in this act, divorcing life from love, we start to see pregnancy as a disease. And if pregnancy is a disease, then, well, abortion must be the cure. And so this whole anti-life mentality is embedded in the whole pornographic lifestyle. And so we've got to reject that because, I mean, not only is it leading to abortions, it's leading to so much sexual abuse. I mean, they say the, I saw one woman who's a, like a pediatric nurse helping kids thrive after being sexually abused. And she said, what we're seeing is the number one perpetrators of sexual abuse are not the live-in boyfriend or the creepy guy down the street or some clergy member is not even close. He said the number one perpetrator of sexual abuse against children is 11 to 15-year-old boys who've been exposed to pornography because they see it on their phones, their parents didn't put a filter on it, and then they want to act it out. And then their little sister has a slumber party and the nine-year-old cousin comes over, parents aren't around, things happen, the girl never reports it, and drags this trauma emotionally well into her adult years before telling anybody. And this is spreading like wildfire. And people say, oh, it's just harmless entertainment and what I do in the privacy of my home hurts nobody, but nothing could be further from the truth. So Jason, that ties into, I think, to your most recent book, right? Maybe we could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, thanks for the question. We've had so many guys come up to us and say, man, I'm struggling with porn. I don't know how to break free or I keep messing up with my girlfriend and going too far. I'm addicted to this or that. And you, what, do you, what should I do? And, and I'd always be like, well, hey, like, get this app and get that filter and read this book and check out that blog and make sure you do this. But it was kind of like a hodgepodge. And I, I kept thinking, like, I just wish we had one thing we could just hand a guy and say, look, man, do this and you're going to find a lot of freedom. And so, because we couldn't find the resource, we just created it. So Matt Frad and I teamed up to create a book called Forged. And so what this is, is a little booklet, you know, not too thick here, you know, 33 Days Towards Freedom. And on the introduction of the book, it tells the guys right away, we want you to text the word Forged to the number 66866. And every day, we're going to send you a video to accompany you on all these 33 days to help you to stay on track. And so, yeah, day one, it's me, and day two, it's Matt. But then we got Father Mike Schmitz and Father Jacques Philippe and Jeff Cavins and uh, Chris Stefanik and Sister Miriam James and all these people every day giving a different little three-minute message to help the guys stay on track. On one of the days, we even have a video compilation of 38 beautiful, awesome, single young women telling the guys, hey, we are so proud of you guys for fighting this fight. Lift up your hearts. Fight for love of your future bride. Defend love from lust. 
And for like a young guy to see that and be like, hey, women find this attractive that I'm pursuing self-mastery, um, it really helps them to lift up their hearts. And we only sell the thing in pairs. Like buy one, you're going to get the second one automatically free because we want fathers doing this with their high school boys. We want college roommates doing it together, high school campus youth ministry boys teaming up to doing this thing because a brotherhood is an essential component of winning this victory. And so the book is called Forged and you can get it at chastity.com. So I'm, I'm just overjoyed to, to be able to hand this to guys. And it really approaches it, I think, from a fully human perspective, that it's not just like, okay, pray it away. It's like, yeah, we need to address spirituality, but also the theology, but then the psychology, the neurology, or the sociology, the relationships, to attack it from all these angles and really getting into the root system underneath these sexual addictions. Because if we're just treating it like lust is the problem, then it's like we're clipping the, the leaves off of a weed we need to get down into the roots. Like first, what are the triggers going on there? When are you messing up? Are you bored, lonely, angry, stressed, or tired? Well, let's find out something new to do during those times of desolation. But even to go to deeper than that, one of the days of the videos, we have a guy named Jay Stringer. He's a Protestant evangelical pastor and counselor. He wrote a book called Unwanted. And in it, he points out that we're tackling this whole issue of porn recovery and sexual sobriety completely wrong. He said, we're treating it like a person's desires and temptations and fantasies are the problem. He said, that's not the problem. He said, that is the roadmap to the person's healing. Because he said, if you would quit just shaming your desires and making yourself think God hates you for having them and start to actually listen to them, not to obey them, but to hear what are they promising you? Like what craving are they promising you that they're going to fulfill? Because I'll bet you underneath that, is a legitimate unmet need that needs to be addressed. And so if you've got a guy addicted to violent pornography of women, or you've got a guy hooked on this or that, you know, where did this come from? At what point in your life did you start wrestling with it? What was going on in your life at that time? And you start looking into these things, instead of treating your desires with shame and repression, just white knuckling it, have a little compassion on yourself. Have a little mercy and patience and kindness towards yourself in this journey, and you will make far more progress than just through some like control management effort to break free. And so throughout the book, we try all these different angles to get down to that root system, to heal it, address it, so you can be free to love. And so again, the book's called Forged, and you can find it at chastity.com. So thanks, Jason. You mentioned some of the people that do some of those videos to help give some of those talks, but were you working with this on your own or who was actually working with authoring the book and putting together the 33 different topics that you were in this book? I was the one who started the book. And then I first reached out to Matt Frad because he had written a book with Life Teen called Victory that was going out of print. And I said, look, there's a lot of good stuff in there. Do you want to merge that content into our stuff that we're going to create? And so we put our heads together, created 33 days. And the idea of forged is that for metal to be forged, like into a sword, you got to get the raw material and then you heat it up to about 2000 degrees. And when you heat the metal up like that, it actually rearranges the grain structure of the metal so that when it cools, it's, it's stronger. But then when it's soft, you kind of beat on it. And so the first phase of the book, the first 10 days, is kind of like, it doesn't make you stronger, it makes you more malleable, maybe a little weak because you're getting down to those roots. And work them through that. And then we get to the, the part where it's forged, like you're kind of beaten on a little bit. And we really get tough with these guys and try to teach them self discipline, different strategies and techniques. And the final phase of forging a sword is it's cooled down and then it's kind of polished and grinded down for perfection, where it's useful now is a weapon. And so the idea is that at the end of 33 days, I mean, you're not perfect. You're not like, oh, I'm free from lust. Don't have to worry about that. It's now you have an arsenal of 33 different tools that you can use or weapons because the world, the flesh, and the devil, it's going to come knocking 10 minutes after you finish reading the book. But now you've got strategies. Now I know, okay, when that flashback happens in my mind during mass or when I'm driving down the street, now I know what to do with that. Now I know, okay, I can pause and I can thank God for making her beautiful and I can pray for her. I can respond to her beauty with love. So we're trying to teach these guys, not just coping mechanisms, but strategies for victory in the battle against lust. Now, Jason, it sounds like it's primarily geared towards younger men who are not married, but is this useful for men in any stage of life? It is. And so we wanted to make sure to mention in there like, hey, this is something that, you know, husbands and fathers need to practice as well. I mean, lust can seep into your own marriage and start to weaken and deteriorate that. It's not like you advance in purity as older that you get. Well, I'm 45 now, so I'm getting really pure. Like, it doesn't work like that. Like, we're all in this together. 
all the way to the end. And so this is something that like men's conferences that the men's can do together, Knights of Columbus, whatever. And, and yeah, a lot of the content is geared for the single guys, but we wanted to make sure throughout the book that so many of these principles would still apply regardless of your state in life. So we're even thinking of donating them to seminarians across the United States because they need to hear this stuff too. I mean, it's something many seminarians are even struggling with in their formation process that like, hey, well, I'll go to the seminary and get better. Well, this stuff needs to get healed, especially before you go through ordination. And so no matter your state in life, this book can apply to you. All right. Well, thanks, Jason, for talking with us today about the connection between chastity and the pro-life movement. How it is that we can all play a part in that. I think we all learned a lot. Thanks for spending time with us today. Well, thank you for having me on. I would just ask listeners, please pray for my wife, marriage, our family, and for all the people we reach with the message of chastity. And don't forget, go to chastity.com for all those resources we've talked about as well. And I want to thank all our viewers and listeners for tuning in on this episode of our Being Pro-Life series. Head to the website to view more resources talked about at www.catholicaoc.org slash being-pro-life. Thanks again for joining us today. I look forward to being with you next time.